Hello and welcome to this very special conversation with Boston Ballet Artistic Director Mikko Nissinen, brought to you by Finlandia Foundation National. And I am Eva Syvänen and I serve on the board of the Finlandia Foundation. Finlandia Foundation is a nonprofit philanthropic organization that was established in Pasadena in, in California, 1953. And to support Finnish culture, past and present in the United States. Finlandia Foundation is a major source of private funding for cultural activities, scholarships and grants. We also sponsor a variety of programs uh, from concerts and lectures to chats as this with Mikko Nissinen. Uh, so we are so very pleased with this visit, Mikko. And it happens on World Ballet Day and what a coincidence. I have been watching ballet the whole morning. So this is fantastic for me. So welcome. Thank you so much. And I want to start with a little confession. Um, I'm very familiar with your work and, and, and with ballet in, in general because I have been a dancer all my life. It's my passion. I was one of those little ballerinas who wanted to attend the Finnish National Ballet School at the Alexander Theater, like way back when, of course. Um, it didn't happen, but ballet has been my passion throughout my life. And I still uh, take class and dance two, three times a week. So Hopefully, yeah, yeah, this is very close to my heart. And that's probably they wanted me to do this, this interview with you. So it's, it's a very nice opportunity for me too. So um, you started at that same place, the Alexander Theater Finnish National Ballet School at age 10. So, um, what led you to taking your first steps in, in dance? Why dance? Well, uh, the way I would put it, you know, I was a really hyperactive kid and I, I did every possible sport and everybody in my neighborhood got tired. The sun went down and I still had energy. At the end, I would ask my parents to clock me when I round, ran around the, 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 the village or whatever, Kula. Uh, the, the city block in, in a way, and it took me five minutes and I was so stupid. I was running and trying to beat my time the rest of the evening until I was pooped. So when, <laughs> when, when there were a couple girls in my class when I was 10 years old and they said they were taking ballet, basically I was interested in these <clears throat> girls and I asked if they had any guys and they said no guys and I said, but is it for the boys as well? And that led me into talking to my buddies to go and take a look at this thing called ballet class. And we liked what we saw. We liked actually the older girls a little bit more than the other ones, but we stumbled into that. Mm -hmm. And within six months, uh, we got recruited to the Finnish National Ballet School, <laughs> all three of us. And it wow. was the first time in 1973 that they started a boys class mm -hmm. with 23 guys. And okay. then you know, that was the initial start. And then when you're in, in, in a school like that, you know, uh, it's it's in an opera house. There's a mm -hmm. ballet company, opera company, orchestra. They do the sets and costumes in the same building. And you're an extra in operas and operettas and ballets. And, you know, the life seemed so much more exciting in that bubble rather than the, the, the little bit more dull reality. Right. So that was every day after yep. school, basically. Yeah. Yep. Right. Right. Uh, so very, very soon uh, you, you won the national ballet competition in Kuopio. And then it was off to the Kirov Ballet in Russia. Yeah, it was. Uh, I, I did the education in, in a manner that uh, I was very unexpected after. Um, after five years, four years, one or four or five years in, in, in the school, I was I got my professional contract. And wow. so I started at the age of 15 and I got immediately to do quite a bit of uh, uh, roles. And uh, second year was pretty much always roles. And I, I already then um, 
traveled during the summer times. I, I used to save all my money to the Paris and London, Copenhagen, and I would buy international dance literature. And I just saw that, you know, Brishnikov, Rudolf Nureyev, and uh, Balanchine, Diaghilev, Nijinsky, they all had a link to uh, St. Petersburg, Leningrad those days. And mm -hmm. um, so I thought, you know, um, I, I would like to go there. And I was still 17 years old when I got the scholarship and I had incredible year, landed incredible teacher, Alec Germanovich Sokolov. And, you know, at this very ripe age, got to dance on the stage of the Marinsky. It was, uh, I don't know if yeah. I even realized it at that point, but that was an incredible year. And I, I was very fortunate and I worked like a slave. I'm sure. I am sure of that. Wow. Wow. So um, how about the United States then? Then how, how did your path lead here? Well, it was a very, uh, in a way, uh, natural since, um, you know, um, it was pretty much me and Yorma Elo. We initially went to the best Finnish summer school. Uh, you know, first we stumbled into Hammond Linna, and then we went to the Kuopio, and then we went to uh, Denmark. You know, it was like we expanded our horizon all the time. And then it was London and Paris. And then at one point we came to America. And um, I have to say, I fell in love with American dance uh, because it was so physical. It was uh, a little bit less theatrical. It was physical and mm -hmm. hyper musical. So um, it was sort of a little dream always. Uh, I was very happy dancing in Amsterdam and then in Switzerland and we toured the world with, a, uh, especially with a Swiss company. And, uh, and I was about 25 year old dancer at that point. And I said to myself, I don't want to understand American dance intellectually and enjoy it. I want to be in it. I wanted to be ingrained in it and learn everything from inside out versus outside in. And I was very lucky. I um, got a contract in San Francisco Ballet uh, at, the, at that point. And it was the, uh, Helgi Thomason was the director, still is actually at the San Francisco Ballet. It was his third season and I found my home. I found the value system and I had incredible colleagues. We really tremendous company toured also the world with them. And um, so for me, it was very natural because I had the spark with America and then it came at the right time and the stars aligned. Yeah. I ended up landing exactly in the right place. Wow, wow. I'm sure it was very different from the Russian style and Russian school. Oh, absolutely. But you know, I've had the, the thought throughout my career always take the best, leave the rest. Take the right. best from the, the, the Finland, Scandinavian way of dancing, take the best for mm -hmm. the Russian. In Holland, it was a combination of British and then uh, much more Dutch contemporary dance. Take the best, leave the rest. Switzerland, you know, uh, sort of a European, a little bit more French, take the best, mm -hmm. leave the rest. Come to America. I always want to learn. And the same thing in America. Now I'm trying to take all those bests and put them into the Boston Ballet and share that those with my dancers and also let the art form continue to develop to its next stage because we are not right. a church or a museum we are living theater for today's people awesome awesome wow uh, so under your direction uh, boston ballet has performed a wide repertoire of classical and contemporary works including your premieres by choreographers such as yorma elo who you all already mentioned so uh, he is also from Finland. Is that is a co coincidence? No. <laughs> yes, it's interesting because uh, um, we go back. Um, I think I was 11 years old at the Finnish National Ballet School, and I think six months later, Jorma joined our class. So we were basically we grew up together in the same class. We did most of our travels together, and mm, okay. um, you know, um, then at one point. We both love classical ballet and we love contemporary dance and just mm -hmm. many, many things in between. He ended up going a little bit more the contemporary route. He got so lucky. He worked mm -hmm. with Max Matzek and Yuri Killian. I mean, just a dream, dream, dream. And um, I went slightly different route. 
and we we met uh we spent a little time in san francisco where i was living in around 97 or 98 and then very shortly i, I uh, moved to calgary canada to go the alberta ballet as an artistic director and uh you know, when you run a ballet company, the budgeting is always the least favorite thing and things get yeah. off, off off your list. And uh, <laughs> I basically had a good season and didn't have much money left. And, and I heard Jorma had done some choreographic workshops in Netherlands Dance Theater. And I, I finally, after six months, he didn't send me the tapes, his girlfriend did. And I liked what I saw. And I usually don't want to work with friends because obvious reasons and you know when Jorma did his first work for us it was tremendous the work was great it developed the dancers wonderfully same thing happened with the second work even with that company we took it even to Finland and Egypt and on our international tours so then when I came to Boston it was natural that I would bring a new voice because the quality and the originality what he represented because there was a person who understood classical ballet, brought very mm -hmm. much sort of a contemporary milieu, but he developed dancers and he was so unique. He was not like, you could say, oh, he does that kind of work. He had the voice of Yorma. And uh, within a couple of years, we formalized our relationship and he has been resident choreographer with Boston Ballet this year, 15 years. Wow. That, that is great. Uh, is, is there any other Finnish artists that you have been working with? Uh, you know, um, we've had um, we've had some uh, Finnish uh, students in our summer school. I often give them a, a free scholarships to come for the exposure. And we had uh, Maria Baranova in a company, I think, for three years. And then, mm -hmm. of course, I bump into different Finnish artists uh, at one point when Esa Pekka Salonen was the resident composer with the New York Philharmonics and when his final evening he put it together in New York he asked Boston Ballet to come and uh, um, uh, be part of the evening it was a collaboration that we had done with Royal Ballet in London and it was to Salonen's music to the core by choreography by Wayne McGregor and uh, we danced in front of the New York Phil, it was incredible. So, wow. and, and you know, he he's my my Finnish hero, you know, Salonen and Kimi Raikkonen and all the hockey players, you know. <laughs> right, right. Well, that sounds awesome. Wow, like a dream. So, um, how about yourself? I'm curious. What what does your day at the office look like? Do you still train, dance every day? Uh, no, no, I I don't train. I I retired. Did I retire? 1990, I think seven. Uh, I did. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I somebody convinced me to try to do something in Canada, and uh, I started training. I said, "Oh, what a wonderful thing to get yourself in shape!" And within th third class that I was taking, I remembered why I retired. You know, I had a herniated disc <laughs> and a really worn hip, and it's like ah. Uh, there's no going back. I did 19 years as hard as I could. And so, um, you know, I, I didn't, uh, I, then I started, you know, staying active in other ways. I, I teach now and I've always yes. been teaching and occasionally I, I do productions and um, in the past I enjoyed tennis very much. So that had mm -hmm. a hip replacement a couple of years ago and that before that it's really, really slowed that down and I'm, I'm still recovering from that to a certain extent. Okay, wow. Um, so you are not only the artistic director for the Boston Ballet, but also for the Boston Ballet School, which is the largest ballet school in North America. So um, since you started there in 2001, there's been lots of changes in the entertainment world and, and the world has become very different. Uh, the attention spans of people are, are very short nowadays, kind of. So how is ballet, in your opinion, uh, holding up in this environment? And how is it, how, how does this impact all the dancers? Well, um, if I start sort of how that impacts and, and the school, it's, um, 
when I came here, the school had around a little bit over 2,000 students, massive school. Now wow. we have about 5,600. Uh, we are wow. huge, naturally. But basically, the motto of the school is to share the love of dance. We want to teach anybody who's interested and give them a, a physical, cultural, social experience while giving them the information and the pleasure and the physical release that comes through physical movement through dance, always through live music. So that's mm -hmm. the big principle. Wow. I'm very proud of that. Uh, to put it in perspective, how many of those 5,600 are aiming at the profession? Mm -hmm. 65. Yeah. It's a very <laughs> narrow track. So uh, yes. that's the other part of that. But, you know, what is dance's place in life today? That's sort of your heart of your question. You know, I, I always think that everybody is a dancer. You know, uh, your heartbeat. Yeah. There's your music. You take three steps. You know, that's a complex coordination. Put a little funk into it. You know, uh, everybody can relate to it. If anything, classical ballet, we didn't add anything. It's a little bit like what Michelangelo said when this, so well, how did you create David? You had that, that piece of rock, how did you do it? And he said, well, I just took out the unessential, which I thought was a brilliant answer. So classical ballet is a little bit a skeleton. We have removed so many ways and created this architecture and, and mm -hmm. simplified architecture. And of course, today's classical ballet is influenced so much from contemporary dance and, and even hip hop and other national elements. It's sort of the melange. So classical ballet, mm -hmm. yes, it's curated through certain productions, but classical ballet is much more like a, a language today. Movement vocabulary mm -hmm. that then is enhanced yeah broken into pieces and put together different ways. So in so many ways, I, I almost wish we wouldn't use the word ballet. Because especially mm -hmm. in North America, I find sometimes that people are like aller allergic to the word ballet because they're dragged into <laughs> these horrendous recitals by three-year-olds and all the yeah. dads think that's ballet. And after they have endured two of these days where I will never go near anything that has the word ballet. So in one way, dance is what we do. Yes, yes, technique can be classical ballet. And we want to do work that is relevant to today's people. And if we do a really good job, uh, it recharges the individual. And there's another principle that I use very much, which is always sort of a key element, <laughs> is that I validate and put the value in the whole process into the audience members experience. I don't mm -hmm. put the value of what's on stage. Naturally, mm -hmm. we want to do exactly the way the choreographer wants. Incredibly musical detail at the highest possible level and understand how that language communicates. But the most important communication is the receiving information that the individual, how do they relate to it? And there's no right, there's no wrong, there is just your way of digesting, digesting that experience. So, so do you think that, that there is even more dance and dancing today then? It's a growing thing, it's not, it's not diminishing. I, I, no. I feel that at adult classes there is so much more, for example, I live in San Diego. Mm -hmm. In California, so we have lots of adult, it's, it's growing, it's not getting smaller yes which is one absolutely and you know uh, if we take the whole covid situation if we manage mm -hmm. through these crises properly and we position our organizations and our repertoire and philosophical approach to social issues and all that correctly we will attract different audiences on top of everything else we've had yeah. People have also realized how much they miss that live communal experience. So mm -hmm. I think when people say, oh, is ballet dead? Mm -hmm. um, if your organization behaves like a church, a 
and curates dance by those that kind of uh, uh, principles, you're in trouble. If you are just a museum, but if you're living theater for today's people and you know where the world is going and you create relativity to that and then you really take risks and pave the future, enjoy that environment of being in a Buddha mind where you always learn and pave. That's what's fun and that will what will move society through exposure forward and the art for format and it's it is alive and hopefully the renaissance we haven't even peaked yet great great so so then came 2020 and the pandemic oh my god we all all have had to you know adjust develop survive how are you doing it you know uh interesting so challenging times mm -hmm. i am so impressed um uh with some of my colleagues uh across the, the the world how they have lived up to the challenge i'm also incredibly uh impressed with boston ballet and our internal uh, situation how we have dealt and, and adjusted and you know basically you know no one's existence, there was no guarantees. We have a, a plan for this year. We have guaranteed our dancers uh, X amount of weeks of work, regardless what happens outside. Mm -hmm. And um, we have, of course, canceled all our shows in, in the fall and in the spring. Mm -hmm. Right now, there's two pro programs scheduled for May uh, to be on stage if the, the universe permits us, but we have converted into a virtual subscription. Uh, we provide uh, virtual content that goes between archival, virtual reality, where we live stream something that is happening at the time, and then, then uh, curated sort of educational material. For example, William Forsythe, who I think is the world's leading choreographer in the field of ballet, we had a long-term partnership and Bill calls now Boston Ballet his new home. You know, he will be curating a, a session at the end of the first evening after they've seen his works from the past with us, something live from the studio. And then he will create a conversation with our dancers on that uh, digital delivery. And, you know, whenever he talks, he's not smart. He's hyper intellectual, smart and fun. It's like, so so brilliant so that's just a little example how one has pivoted uh, i myself i've been following a lot the the royal opera house in london because my son lives in london so whenever i go to london i it's it's a it's a ballet <laughs> yeah so it's giselle or something at the opera house that's and one time even i i we had the tour the backstage tour which was great the whole day um watching the the class and all the everything it, it, it was my dream day so anyways um they they have online online oh, like you said all the all the ballets are trying to survive and, and create these online online programs and like you have done now i'm learning about your bb at your home which is great i'm definitely going to subscribe so can you tell a little more about that what's coming well, um, in, in general, the challenge with, with the, whether it's a Royal Ballet, um, I'm quite a bit touched with Kevin O'Hare, who's the director there, and, and our, our other colleagues, you know, yes, there are ways that we can cr create some material. But for example, Royal Ballet is a government funded organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, this right. year, uh, Boston Ballet got from Washington zero dollars out Usually our budget is 35 million and uh, city of Boston gives us every year $1,500. Big wow. help. Exactly. I don't know what to say. Should I bow or should I just breathe in and out? Um, naturally, the state is a, it's a little bit more general, generous, but the percentages are like, they, if I total all that, it starts with zero point or something. So, how Europe deals with this and how America deals with this is mm -hmm. apples and oranges. You can compare them. 
So, um, mm. but I we have a whole plan for the the whole year uh, through these digital su subscriptions and you know showcasing the the three prong repertoire that we do. One one of them, of course, is on a classical ballet, which this year we have the least because of the limitations with the working in the ten person pods. You know the the mm -hmm. emphasis and you know all the restrictions makes it we, don't, we can't do any big classical ballet but we yeah. don't want, want to forget people who come through that door and, and that's the initial interest but uh from the creativity point of view i would be so bold to predict that we from all the lessons we've learned this year they're going to stick with us some of those things will stick with us as uh mm -hmm. as uh, extra material to keep the people who are interested closer to home and um, from the school to the company, I think we will look different. And the other part is, you know, we have always pride ourselves at the Boston Ballet to be the ballet company of the future. And I guarantee if we come out of this crisis after the political turmoil that is in this country and after Black Lives Matter and all this DEI work, we're doing so much of that. And thank God we're already in the implementation stages. If we come as the same company as we were, I promise we are not the ballet company of the future. We are the ballet company of the past. And that is one of those scenarios like, you know, we're not the museum. So we have to adapt to whole new culture in the world. Yeah. And not only us, everybody. And everybody who doesn't want to acknowledge or do that, they'll find out. Yep, yep. The world is not going to be the same ever anymore, right? So, um. The Nutcracker. For many, many Americans, ballet is the Nutcracker. And you, I understand, are, are do you have a performance of the Nutcracker on TV in in the Boston area? Or? Yes. How is that happening? Well, basically, uh, what is Nutcracker in America? It's a gateway to the art form of ballet. That's how I put it. It's the first exposure. We get about 90, between 90,000 and 100,000 people see the production every year. Yeah. And um, I created the production so that it would be always fresh for the audiences. It's very difficult mm -hmm. technically for the dancers because I know I have a tired company after 43 shows, but I know yeah. I also have a better company technically, artistically. So I use it as a dancer development tool, engagement, mm -hmm introduction to the art form and then uh, it's a celebration to bring families together and kick off the holiday season so that's the premises of the nutcracker and serious musical point of view so uh come this year um no nutcracker you know that pro provides us about five million dollars of the salaries to the organization yeah. huge hit so uh we have teamed up with the NBC 10 in the Boston area and Telemundo. We will do a one hour version with a, a narration by a celebrity that we haven't confirmed yet uh, in Telemundo in Spanish and in, in um, NBC 10 in English, you know, really trying to reach and re reach into the communities and give it easier access point to different um, cultural uh, pockets of, of the there's a cultural, um, um, what's the right word? You know, I try to reach across the cultural boundary. So, and right. uh, of course it's, it's, it's not the full version, uh, but it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's about uh, 50 some minutes of dancing. So we're in the middle, middle of creating that and figuring how the narration and all that match, mm -hmm. matches and meshes so that the end product is going to be good. We have a fantastic uh, broadcast dates, first in Thanksgiving and then on the 25th. And I think it's going to have a probably six, seven showings all together. So that's what we had to do, what we, we were able to do when we couldn't do the other. Right. Is, is, is that available anywhere on the West Coast? Can, can I see it anywhere? Is it going to no. be on YouTube? No, Nothing, it's no. not. Uh, you know, I deal with five different unions. Dancers Union, Musicians Union, Wardrobe Union, Stagehand Union, you get the picture. We got conferences right. from uh, uh, 
from from the, from the unions and it was uh, restrictive and um, under the circumstances they were they were wonderful but um, this is a capture it's not new filming because we can't be in the theater this is a right. capture from last year's <laughs> dress rehearsal that is okay. edited and it, it, okay. was, it was supposed to be two uh, camera capture, but luckily we had another close-up camera as well. So the end product is gonna be almost as uh, technically brilliant as, as, as if you would film it. It's not gonna match that, but the heart is there and the dance is, dancing is very good, but it is local. Right, right, okay. Because well, of that, that, I also wanted to keep it local. If it was gonna be nat national, then I would have put put in my perfectionism hat on and we would have <laughs> rented the theater for three weeks and build all these moving camera things. And, uh, you know, those budgets are several million dollars. And but that's not that was not going to happen this year. And we didn't didn't go there. So when you get a lemon, lemon, you make lemonade. And I'm just so <laughs> thrilled that we are able to give the nut, gift of Nutcracker to the people of the Boston area when the real thing doesn't exist. Yeah, that's real Christmas spirit, right? That'll bring it, yeah. So um, let's go back to Finland. Uh, you have earned great acclaim for your work. And in 2019, you were recognized by the Finnish government and appointed Knight First Class Order of the Lion of Finland. That is quite an honor and congratulations. Thank you. I, I was very touched. You know, um, I am dual citizen, of course, between uh, Finland and America, mm -hmm. but, you know, uh, I'm so Finnish. I'm so proud of my heritage. <laughs> uh, I still, uh, you know, uh, in, in my DNA, uh, through my grandparents and my parents, the Second World War, you know, uh, and e everything finished from the music. Uh, I've always tried to be such a ambassador as an individual through my dancing years mm -hmm. and all. It means a lot. So, so when I got the recognition, it, it really meant something. Wow, yes. So, um, how, how would you describe your Finnishness in, in your work, in your artistic vision? Well, there's that, that there's that bold Finnish directness and honesty, yes. you know, and, and the determination, the sisu, and uh, you know, the even my tenure you now, 19 years with the Boston Ballet, you know, 08, we were in a really dire straight situation with the financial crises around the world, and um, I have to say, in, in the darkest of the hours, uh, I was then the executive director and the and the artistic director, and we didn't have a chairman of the board at the moment for 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 a period of six months. And uh, you know, I, I recognized how difficult the situation was, and I wanted to communicate with the whole organization, staff, dancers, and everybody. I talked to them every week. I told them the truth. I didn't give them the pink story. And I told them that we can get through this if they take care of their sec sector, what they do. Mm -hmm. They don't have to worry about the big pic picture. I do that. And uh, I remember the, the days where, of course, they were overwhelming and incredible amount of energy and hours. But when I reached out to the strength, I would watch the Second World War uh, documentaries of the Finnish and the Russian war. And uh, I found my strength there. And I was like, you know, we have a difficult situation in hand, but what Finland faced was a hell. And, you know, mm -hmm. there was no way I was going to give up. The, the, the failure was not an option. And then things happened and things started moving and some other stars got aligned we, you know, the keyboard members, somebody else joining the board and the nucleus that within three years, incredible renaissance started. And not only did we pay like almost $10 million of debt, 
we started investing, we renovated our building, built a theater in our building, uh, a small theater, started investing in repertoire, expanded the company size, uh, took on international touring. You know, we eventually did a week in the Lincoln Center in, in New York, week in Col Coliseum in London, which just last year ago, April, we had incredible uh, success in Paris, Théâtre de saint Elysée, and you know, from ashes comes the next renaissance. And, uh, and I hope, I hope that the humankind and arts in general will have the same kind of renaissance after COVID. We've had enough dark times and uh, navel gazing and, you know, it's time to get out to the world and put out our next energy out there and, and um, live again. Yep, we sure will. The Finnish CISO and perseverance will endure. Yep. yep. Right. Um, so a little bit about yourself here still. Um, your time off. What do you enjoy to do when you're not dancing? Or do you have any time off? Well, uh, time is scarce, but you know, um, it's also very important. And um, there was time that I, I didn't have any time for myself. And, and I, I felt that, you know, I was just serving the same soup, but I never had time to put ingredients into the soup. And, but I have to say it has been uh, quite a bit better last five, a little bit over five years, five plus mm -hmm. years. And um, I'm, I, I enjoy um, cooking and uh, sort of a Finnish, Scandinavian, Sicilian, Japanese, and pretty much anything and experimenting different techniques. And um, I really like from the, anything from high end, but I also like to catch my own fish, treat them and wow. then bring them, mm -hmm. whether it's a Japanese uh, cuisine or whatever, direction I take. I I, um, I fish for tuna and just everything mm -hmm. else. And um, that, that is a huge passion. And with wow. COVID, I started something else that's, that's sort of a very interesting because it's like a magnifying class to my past. Uh, when I was a kid, I was, I was co collecting stamps. And oh. I started, I decided I want to collect all the stamps of Finland. And when I start something, I go way too deep. And I think now I, I'm missing two pieces and it's just a question what day I want to spend the little money on those two pieces. But having gone through from the first stamp in Finland and seeing all the periods like saying, oh my God, this is the year when my grandfather was born. And oh, this was the 1920s and you know, Finland was in this state. and seeing the artistic and the social commentary that comes through that, the color palette, I can almost feel how the, the different um, decades were. And uh, all the way to the, you know, the year when I was born and then I, that 20 years when I was formative years growing up in Finland, uh, it's fascinating. That is, the Finnish stamps actually are really beautiful. And, and I know because my mother used to also collect stamps all the, you know, every time there was a new release of stamps, she had them. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, awesome. Yeah, that, that's interesting. Very interesting. But then cool. that, that of course kicked me off. It was, I thought it was going to be so difficult. I mean, then I did Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Iceland, Holland, Belgium, France, Italy, Japan, Russia, and, uh, U.S. is a little bit more complicated in the early, early stamping, but rekindled something mm -hmm. from the past. Okay. And hey, how about sauna? Do you en enjoy the Finnish sauna? Yes. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, I, I have a house in southern Maine in Kennebunk. And mm -hmm. uh, my sauna, new sauna, should be ready in about a month's time. I can't wait. Oh, Christmas sauna. Yes. I can't. Awesome. I simply can't wait. Oh. I'm jealous. I'm jealous. <laughs> All right. Um, I think our time is, is, is coming to an end. So uh, anything else on the horizon you would like to share with the well, Finlandia Foundation, national members and all, 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 our, all the Finns in, in, 
the U.S. Well, I, I think um, it's a, it's a very special to be um, a Finnish or have have Finnish blood or Finnish mother or father or a spouse, and uh, I, I think, like I mentioned earlier, the um, sort of the mentality of the take the best and leave the rest. Uh, it's so good to see how healthy the psychology of Finland is. Uh, and, you know, when you look at how well they do from education, two days ago in, in a French newspaper front page, they said Finland has done the best job with the COVID. You know, I'm, I'm very proud of all the, all the achievements, what's happening and the mentality. Uh, I've lived away from Finland now a long time and uh, I'm in a different community and I uh, try to, to contribute just like all of you in, into the communities where we are, but also we, we bring the, the best aspect of the Finland and put them forward and hopefully s uh, spread the word in that sense. And, uh, and uh, life is about experiences and, uh, you know, when I was a kid in the school, I felt like you know, the borders are just on a map. There's no borders in mm. life. And today's world is more open and more uh, available to any of us as long as we have the curiosity and uh, interest to be exposed. I mean, the world has so much to offer. One lifetime gets you to scratch <laughs> a little bit of that 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 surface and let's not waste waste that and enjoy ourselves and believe in ourselves. We can do anything we want when we put our minds into it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So when times get changed and, and if you ever travel to San Diego, most welcome. I'm the president of the House of Finland in San Diego and the House of Finland is a, is a chapter of the Finlandia Foundation too. So we could create something cool in San yeah. Diego if ever, if ever your path leads here. Oh, I'm sure, awesome. I'm sure it will, will, and uh, I love San Diego and uh, don't know when, but I'll make sure I'll be in touch. One of these days, hopefully. Great. Mm -hmm. So, hey, thank you so much. This has been wonderful and great. Wonderful. Thank it's, you so much. It's been my pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this visit with Mikko Nissinen and learning about his professional path from Helsinki to leading Boston Ballet, one of the finest dance companies in the United States. It was so interesting to hear his insights on the status of dance today and in what he sees for the future and his philosophy of dance in the lives of young people. I really enjoyed his comments on how his Finnishness affects the work and life of this accomplished American Finn. Very inspiring. On behalf of Finlandia Foundation, I wish to thank Mikko for his time and gracious participation. We welcome your support so that we may continue to share these types of conversations as well as musical and other presentations related to Finland and Finnish culture in the US. I invite you to turn to our website and social media to learn about our organization and future programs. Please visit finlandiafoundation.org.